Okay, so we're going to be finishing up with the life of Joseph today. And what we're going to be looking at is actually uh, Joseph as a picture of Jesus Christ because we see a type of Christ in the life of Joseph. And so we're going to be studying him today and we're going to kind of be reflecting on the career and the ministry of Joseph. But before we begin, let's go ahead and go to Romans chapter 8, verse number 28. The Bible says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, I'm actually going to jump into this verse a little bit later on, and we're going to be exploring it from a different angle. Uh, But I do want to let you guys know, if you have those books, I've changed the title, and I've kind of changed the point. Um, I've already preached on the forgiveness that Joseph showed his brothers on a Wednesday night a couple weeks back, and so I don't want to renew those things. Hey, instead I want to look at something else that wasn't really covered, but I think is, a, is critically important, and it kind of follows the same flow with what we've been discussing. The last two weeks as we've met together, uh, we talked about how God's plan for our life often takes a very circuitous route. It doesn't go the way that we expect it will. And then last week we talked about doing right no matter what the circumstance. And so today, what I want to be looking at is kind of, we're going to wrap up the life of Joseph, and I want to take a look at it after it's been wrapped up. And if I can just ask this question, you know, what is the point hey, of this life? Uh, anyway, we're going to go ahead and pick up in uh, Genesis chapter 41, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of give a brief summary because these are things that we're just passing over. So as you know, Joseph, after he escaped from that uh, uh, woman who was trying to catch him in adultery, uh, he escaped. Unfortunately, he was thrown in prison for it. And so he spends his time in prison. And while he's in prison, there are two men that come up to him and they have these dreams, a butler and a baker. And the butler, he has these dreams that he is given these clusters of, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, grapes that he squeezes into the cup of Pharaoh. And Joseph interprets the dream correctly and he gets lifted up back into his position before time. Then there is this baker who has three baskets of head, and he's lifted up, and the birds eat, you know, basically the bread out of it, and Joseph once again correctly interprets it as in three days' time that the baker was going to be hung up, and the birds were going to eat his flesh off of him, uh, which is not the best dream, you know, good luck sleeping after that, Uh, but that's what took place. Well, then Joseph is forgotten in prison for two years, and for two years, I believe he continued to do right, but he was forgotten. Uh, But this wasn't an accidental forgetness. This was something that was done on purpose because we needed something in particular to happen. You see, Pharaoh had to have a dream. If the butler had mentioned Joseph at any other time, Pharaoh would not have cared. Here comes Butler, who's out of prison, and Butler comes up to him and says, hey, there's a guy that interpreted this dream for me. Okay, and that's what Joseph wanted, uh, you know, the butler to do, is mention my name to Pharaoh. Tell Pharaoh what happened here. And if the butler had gone and told the Pharaoh what had happened, he's like, yeah, there's this guy that interpreted my dream, Pharaoh probably would have been like, okay, cool, and then moved on with life. But when Pharaoh himself had a dream and nobody else could interpret it, suddenly God brings it into remembrance in the mind of the butler, and the butler's like, I know a guy. And so imagine, one morning Joseph wakes up and he is on a prison floor, Hey, I mean, I don't think they had beds in kind of, you know, nice. Once again, this is a place where they were chained up, and so there may have been a cot of some sort, but he woke up in a cold, dark, dank dungeon in chains. Hey, and then Joseph went and he stood before Pharaoh. Hey, and, you know, we talk about extreme makeovers, uh, you know, and that's kind of being popular, but Joseph went from these prison rags and like, okay, we got to clean you up because you're going to stand before, you know, the Pharaoh. And suddenly Joseph is thrust into the very presence of Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him the dream. Joseph tells him the interpretation thereof. And notice this. Okay, it is not in me, God shall give an answer, uh, fa- excuse me, uh, give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And so Joseph immediately gives God the glory. And so Joseph isn't even trying to claim, you know, hey, remember me and I'm pretty great, you should keep me around. He's like, no, no, this isn't even me. And what, an, what a guy, you know, with an audience before the Pharaoh, with all the problems that he has in life, he immediately deflects the credit to God. He just gives all the glory to God. And I think Joseph is like, all right, um, can I keep this shirt, you know, as I go back into prison? Like, it fits me pretty well. You know, it's got prison germs all over it, so you don't want it, right? And so he's planning on going back, but that is not God's plan. Uh, We see in the very next couple verses that Pharaoh and all of his servants were like, yeah, Joseph should be in charge. And again, what a work God had done in the hearts of these people. Imagine all these different advisors and all these different generals and all these different people. You know, I wonder, Potiphar, or excuse me, yeah, he was the captain of the guard. Was Potiphar there in this meeting? We don't see him specifically mentioned, but I mean, come on, he's the captain of Pharaoh's guard. That's a pretty important guy. And now here is Joseph standing in front of him, and everyone says, yeah, this guy that's been in prison, this uh, Hebrew slave, he should totally be in charge of us. Incredible. I mean, there had to be a little bit where Joseph's like, this is another one of those dreams. (laughs) 
But that night he went to bed on a beautiful, soft pillow. I mean, he slept in you know, the prison to the palace in the course of a single day. Everything absolutely changed. He went from being in these chains of steel to wearing chains of gold. He went from being in a place where he was, you know, cast out and forgotten and dismissed to now he was going to be in, I mean, all of Egypt had to be talking about this guy. I mean, imagine that kind of meteoric rise to power and all of a sudden, yeah, there's a new boss. Who? His name is Joseph. Well, who's he? Oh, he was a prisoner and a slave. Why is he in charge? And then you start seeing what he's doing, and God blesses in a mighty way. I mean, Joseph was incredibly intelligent and wise with his handling of people. And so we see he starts to gather up all these grains in these seven years of plenty. Uh, and Joseph, excuse me, Pharaoh's dream that he had these seven pieces of corn that looked really good. Uh, and then they were eaten by seven pieces of corn that looked not so good. And then the dream was repeated with seven kind. And so I kind of wanted to title this message, you know, Seven uh, Killer Kind and Killer Corn, uh, just because I like the title, not because it has anything to do with what we're talking about today. Um, and Anyway, but the only rational explanation for the rise of Joseph was God. You know, Joseph, as he laid in bed that night, having slept, you know, that previous morning on a prison floor, and now he's laying in this soft feathered bed, the only thing that has to be running through his mind is, how in the world did God do this? Joseph couldn't look at anything that he did and said, you know, because of my whatever, this is why I'm here. This was entirely, completely dependent on God, and God should have received all the glory for this, and he did receive all the glory for this, and that's a testimony to Joseph. Now, we know the story as it continues on. Jacob, Israel, okay, the famine's now in the land, so it's been nine years later, so we're fast-forwarding nine years. Joseph gets married. He has two kids, Ephraim and Manasseh. Those are two of the tribes of Israel that we see later on. Joseph received a double portion. Uh, anyway, but the famine is going so sore that way back in the land of Canaan, okay, uh, dad and the family are getting hungry, and so they hear that there is corn in Egypt. Hey, and once again, I just imagine, here is Israel. Here is Jacob, and he hears about this corn in the land of Egypt, and hey, there is somebody over there that knows what's going on. There is somebody that's taking care of everything and is kind of feeding the world at this point, and he's completely ignorant that that's his son. How cool would that be to find out that there's this hero in Egypt, and he is preserving everybody, and that's his boy. But at this point, he thinks his son is dead. So anyway, he sends down his ten brethren, excuse me, Joseph's ten brethren. He leaves Benjamin behind, and Joseph, okay, he's going to test them. But the brethren, they come before Joseph, and they bow down before him. And it's in that moment that Joseph's dreams, back from when he was a boy, are suddenly brought to remembrance. And he's looking down, and here he sees these ten men bowing down before him. You know, he made himself strange to them, and so here he is, and again, he just has to be in absolute astonishment. I don't even think he's over there glorying or gloating that his brothers are bowing down to him. I don't think he cares about that one bit. What I think he's doing is magnifying the goodness of God. He's like, this is exactly what God said was going to happen, and here they are, he, and he never would have suspected Surely he would have suspected, you know, with the, the fulfillment of that dream that, you know, he would one day lead his father's household. Little did he know he would lead an entire nation at that point as his brothers are bowing down to him. And again, here we see the picture. The picture was of sheaves that were bowing down. And why were his brethren there? To receive grain, to go and get those sheaves. And so here you see Joseph is getting an interpretation of the dream all these years later that he didn't even perceive at that time. And the goodness of God and the wisdom of God and the foresight of God have to be at the forefront of Joseph's mind as his brethren are bowing down. He's thinking, how great a God. He knew it. He told me, and I would have never guessed, and yet it's true. It's all 100% true. And think of everything that had happened over the course of Joseph's life. And again, one day he went into work like any other day, and suddenly there are his brothers bowing down. And the fulfillment came on a day that you would never have expected. It was just like any other day. As far as I can tell, Joseph didn't wake up that morning saying, hey, today's the day, guys. And yet it was. It's the day. They bowed down before him. And everything, all of God's promises are once again brought into his remembrance. Now, as you know, Joseph tested his brethren. He accused them of being spies, that they're coming to seek out, you know, the goodness of the land, and they're going to take it for themselves. And of course, they say, no, we're not going to do that. And Joseph says, okay, well, I'm going to test you. I want you to go and bring your little brother. And this little test, okay, was a perfect 
chance to see if his brethren had actually changed. Because he had been sold out for the benefit of his brethren. Would there's his brethren sell out their new baby brother, Benjamin, for their benefit? Has anything changed over the intervening years? Or are these different men that are standing before? You know, Joseph had made himself strange, and he's looking at his brothers wondering, are you the same guys that heard me crying out for mercy while you sold me into slavery? to go into the land of Egypt, are you going to sell your little brother into slavery in the land of Egypt as well? And so when they did end up bringing their little brother, that's the test that he gave them. He says, you're going to have Benjamin stay and he's going to be my servant forever. You're going to sell Benjamin into slavery. And Judah says, no, not this time. And I find it incredible because Judah was the one that said, hey, let's sell our brother. And this time Judah's the one saying, take me instead. Not, not, not Benjamin. I, I can't do that. I can't do that to my father. I can't do it anymore. You know, this, this belongs to me. After what I did to Joseph, I am the one that deserves to be sold into slavery, so allow me to be the one. Let Benjamin go free. And Joseph, in that moment, he saw a great change in his brothers. And it's not until repentance comes in that the restoration follows. You know, Joseph was willing to pay. Joseph was willing to forgive. Joseph was willing to do all of that. But until he saw repentance, okay, that forgiveness and the restoration of the relationship would never be received. But then we see in Genesis chapter 45, and I know I'm going quickly. Don't worry. We're going to be stopping as we're going along. But I want to show you where we are in Scripture as we talk through this, okay? But then we see Joseph. At this point, he can't take it anymore. And so I want to start here in verses 1 through 3. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And so here is Judah's plea. He's saying, Please take me instead. Make me a bondman. Let Benjamin go free. And Joseph at this point, the Bible says he could not refrain himself. You ever see somebody where just the emotions are starting to pour out of their face? And they're not starting to cry out yet, but you can see the flush start coming. You can see the tears welling up. You can see the tenseness and just their body language instantly shifts. And here is Joseph. Now, as far as they know, these brothers are looking at Joseph, and this guy is in charge of all of Egypt, and they've just been accused of being thieves, not once, but twice, of being spies. I mean, this is not someone that they think of as their friend, even though they had, you know, just this wonderful meal. They're like, he's been kind to us, and we've totally taken advantage of him. And now, here they see him, and there's this rush of emotion going on, and he yells, cause every man to go out from me. Everyone get out of here. How small do you think those brothers felt in that moment? I mean, at this point, there had been no comfort. There had been nothing telling them that everything is going to be okay. All they know is that this guy that's in charge of Egypt is commanding all of his servants to get out. And I know the thought that had been in my head at that moment. He's going to kill me, and he doesn't want any witnesses. Okay? But that's not what happened. The Bible says in verse 2, And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in house of Pharaoh heard. Remember, they were all caused to go out. And here he is in the house of Pharaoh, which if there was a big house in the land of Egypt, I imagine it was the house of Pharaoh. Like that would be the biggest house. That would have the most servants. That would have the most guards. That would have the most people there. And yet the whole house of Pharaoh heard as this guy just starts wailing, just breaks down in tears, sobbing. And again, I think of these brothers as they're looking over at Joseph, who they don't know is Joseph, and this guy, this ruler in all of Egypt, is just uncontrollably sobbing. And again, they don't know who he is. He hasn't revealed himself yet. He hasn't said anything. And he's wailing to the point where the entire house hears. You ever heard somebody cry in another room? As a father of four girls, it's a daily occurrence. It is very attention-grabbing. <laughs> hey, it's, what is going on? And Pharaoh's house heard it, and all attention was brought to them. And there are these brothers looking at this incredibly powerful man, the second most powerful man in the world at that time, and only second to Pharaoh in basically name. I mean, Joseph was the doer of everything. This guy had the control. You went through Joseph. And he is just sobbing. And I think, what a tender heart Joseph had for his brethren. I mean, they were the ones that offended him. They were the ones that had attacked him, that had sold him out, that had abandoned him, who in the intervening years, they never once sought him out. Never. 
They never sent a search party to go and look for Joseph or find out what happened to Joseph as far as we can tell in scriptures. He was not sought of them. He was not loved of them. He was betrayed by them. And yet in that moment of repentance, and all it took was that moment of repentance, and he immediately burst into tears. Why? Because he was going to have his brothers back. He just wanted his family And it's incredible. You look over the life and the the ministry and the service of Joseph and everything that had happened to him, all the pain, all the sorrow, all the hardship, the imprisonment, the accusations, the servanthood, hey, all of it, none of it ever emotionally swayed him. But then his brother saying, we were wrong, broke him, absolutely broke him to the point he said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren couldn't answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Yeah, I would be too. What do you say to that? You're Joseph? And again, think of the flood of emotions that must have come into them at this moment where they realize it's Joseph. Oh. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) Hey, And Joseph, he took note of this. And Joseph said to his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. Okay, (laughs) and they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Look at this kindness and this consideration of Joseph as he's saying, look, don't worry about all the evil things you did to me, okay? I know that's what you're worried about. Joseph is more emotionally invested in how his brothers are doing with the realization that the person that they betrayed and that they had hurt and that they had wounded now has all authority and has power over their life and Joseph is worried about comforting them, not them comforting him. Joseph is entirely invested. Guys, it's okay. It's okay. I'm your brother. I'm going to take care of you. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house. And so the brothers, they have to go back and, you know, Joseph says, go get dad. Okay, and so the brothers are going to go and get dad. And I think it's a wonderful thing that that conversation wasn't recorded in the Bible because, man, that'd be embarrassing, right? I mean, there's certain things that, you know, God tells us, but that conversation, you know, I think it was a tender mercy of God saying, yeah, we're not going to put that in the Bible, because really, what do you say if you're Joseph's brethren? Like, you're going to show up and you have all these different wagons from the land of Egypt carrying all these different gifts and stuff, and of course, Israel's going to come out, and he's been grieving this entire time, and you know, whenever he sees his sons come back from the field, he has to be wondering what next. I mean, you just look at the history uh, with those brothers and what they did every time they came home, and it was never good news. Okay, and now here they come with all these different, you know, things, and he's wondering, what did you do now? And then they come up and said, okay, Dad, good news, Joseph's alive. What? Yeah, Joseph's alive. Well, well, what do you mean he's alive? And the Bible says that he didn't actually believe him because, once again, you know, a track record that speaks for itself. Uh, but Joseph's, you know, brothers, they weren't believable at this point, but they're telling their dad, yeah, he's alive. Well, what happened? Okay, remember that time we told you that he died? Okay. Yeah, no, he didn't. (laughs) Yeah, we sold him into slavery. Great news. (laughs) No, (laughs) no, not so much great news. Okay, but we actually see that God comes to Jacob in a vision. He comes to Israel in a vision and he says this. And he said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. And it's at this point that God comes and he actually reveals to Jacob, that's Joseph, his son. And to me, this is very interesting because at any point, God could have told Jacob his son was alive, but he didn't. And you know, I think there's a good reason why. Because if Israel had known that his son was alive in Egypt, he would have killed the other sons. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) That would have been the end of the tribes. Anyway, but he would have gone and tried to rescue Joseph. I have no doubt in my mind. He would have gotten everybody together and they would have stormed into the capital of Egypt to go and rescue his son. And he would have taken his son out of the will of God because his son was supposed to be in Egypt. His son was supposed to be in the prison. His son was supposed to be a slave. And Jacob wouldn't have stood for it. You know, sometimes people wonder, man, wouldn't it be great to see the future? Absolutely not. I don't think so. God reveals to us what he wants us to know. And if he doesn't reveal to us something, it's not meant for us to know. We're just not supposed to know. 
And so the point is to have trust in God, not in the situation or try and wrest control of a situation. Anyway, uh, that's just a little bonus point. But here's what I want to get to. In Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, I want to answer and talk about just a single question. And so we're going to be cruising through some things, but here's the idea, okay? Now, I want you to think over the life of Joseph, now that we've kind of, you know, brushed up on it, we've kind of gotten this summary of the life of Joseph, what was the greatest thing that he ever accomplished? Now, what is the most impressive moment of Joseph's life? You know, and I think if we sat down and we all had to write out on a piece of paper, what was the most impressive thing Joseph ever did? What was the greatest work of Joseph's life? We might get a bunch of different answers in the auditorium today. So, for example, someone could write down saying, well, I think the greatest moment in the life of Joseph was when he was sold into slavery, and yet he served Potiphar to the very best of his ability. And maybe the person in the pew sitting next to that one says, well, I actually think it was when he resisted the temptation and he fled from Potiphar's wife that was the moment no 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 that's not it it was when joseph was sold into or excuse me put into prison falsely and even while in chains he continued to serve until he was put in second of that because he was such a minister that's the highlight and you say no that's not it it was when joseph was interpreting the dreams okay i mean that showed the wisdom of god and the holy spirit of god you know working through him as god revealed this wisdom that's it and you say no maybe that's not it maybe it's when you know joseph after everything is said and done he's headed to second in the command of all of egypt and he's taking in all this grain and he is you know literally saving the world i mean the guy is a world hero at this point because of the grain he's gathering that's the greatest work of joseph's life and someone says are you kidding me that's not it the most incredible thing that he did was forgive his brothers after everything that was said and done and so we can go through and we can parcel out the life and the ministry of joseph and say this was the greatest no this was the greatest no this was the greatest i disagree i don't think any of that was the greatest part of joseph's life there wasn't one individual moment, although those individual moments were no doubt incredible. But I want to ask you a question, and it's going to bring up the verse that is behind me. Compared to the goodness and the greatness and the glory of God's work, what did Joseph do that could ever begin to compare? When, you look at, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? In the grand scheme of what God is doing in this world, this is just one small blip in history, one man's life. And there are some key moments, and God used him in a mighty way. But deliverance can come from God in any multitude of different ways. He didn't need Joseph. We see different instances in the Bible where you know, God brings in quail that surrounds the entire camp of Israel where they could be fed. We see for 40 years he sends them manna from heaven. God never needed Joseph. We see Jesus Christ sitting down and breaking bread to feed the 5,000. And so, what was so great about what Joseph did? It's just God. It's to God that all the glory belongs. Psalm 115, verse number 1 says this, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. So here's what I want to kind of drive home. There's just one single point to this message, and that is that the great work of Joseph's life was being an image and a type and a picture of Jesus Christ who has all the glory. The greatest thing that Joseph ever did was not in some task that he accomplished. It was not in some mission that he finished. It was in picturing Jesus Christ. And you go through the life of Joseph and you see picture after picture after picture of Jesus Christ. I mean, back in the very beginning, you see that Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. He made him a coat of many colors. So we see Joseph here that he is this beloved son of the Father. And then we compare that to Jesus Christ, Matthew 3, 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we see that Joseph here gets to be a picture of Jesus Christ because of the relationship that the son has with the father. And something that I think needs to be stressed as Christians in our homes, in our hearts, is understanding the relationship that Jesus Christ has with God the Father. Because if we don't understand the relationship and how close that relationship is between Jesus Christ and his heavenly father, we don't understand the sacrifice. You know, Jesus Christ, God is the creator of all things. He can make something and he can give it. What's a sheep to him? It's nothing but, you know, the handiwork of his fingers. This is no major sacrifice. 
You know, God did not struggle with any part of creation. As he goes through the six days and he says, let there be, I mean, literally in just a few words, all of creation came to be, all the laws that govern us, from the macro to the micro, God completed it all in six days, and then he took the seventh day off, okay, as a day of rest to be a pattern for us, not because he was tired or worn out. He's God. He can create all things. And yet the sacrifice that he gave was not in something that he made, it was in himself. He gave of himself. When we understand the, the incredible gift that God has given to us in the sacrifice of his only begotten son, then we can begin to understand the love that God has toward us, that he would give us that son. If I can put it this way, the only thing in the universe that is irreplaceable is God. And that's what he gave. When we understand the payment that was made, suddenly we can understand that that payment is sufficient for our sin. We need to know that relationship, and Joseph here is a picture of that relationship. Joseph is also a picture of being rejected. You know, the Bible says this, And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him, yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And remember, it was the dream that Joseph was one day going to rule over them, and they hated it, they rejected it, they pushed him away. And once again, what a picture that is of Jesus Christ. Matthew 24, 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Talking about his coming, uh, rule and reign over this planet. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now here, Jesus Christ, he was foretold all things. He knew all things. Jesus Christ, he knew that one day he is going to rule and reign. It is going to happen, and yet, here he is looking out over Israel, over Jerusalem, sitting on that Mount of Olives, where one day he is going to make his glorious entrance and return to rule and reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years and through eternity after that. But here he is knowing what would take place in the future. Just as Joseph had received these dreams saying, one day this is going to be, Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry knew that one day these things were going to be, but the way was going to be hard, and it wasn't going to be the way that the disciples or other men expected. First, before he came as the conquering king, he was there to be the suffering savior, and suffer he did. You know, Genesis chapter 37, verse number 13, the Bible tells us that Israel said to Joseph, do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem. Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, here am I. Now, Joseph's problems began when he was sent by his father to go and minister to a people that hated him, as did Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He too was going out and looking for lost sheep, and he was looking for Israel. He was sent to the nation of Israel, and yet they're the ones that rejected him. They're the ones that beat him. They're the ones that cast him out. They're the ones that sold him for pieces of silver, even as Joseph was. You know, they were, they were trying to get rid of him. They sold him for these 20 pieces of silver. Jesus Christ, he was appraised of a higher price, a goodly price. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value. This time it was Judas instead of Judah who sold him out. But again, we see a picture of Jesus Christ. And we may look at this and say, you know, it's an awful thing that happened to Joseph to be betrayed and sold by his brethren. But it gives us a better understanding of Jesus Christ when he was betrayed and sold out by his own familiar friend. When it was our sins that put him there. When they fled from him, when they ran away from him, even as he was going through his trial. And you know, Peter's in the courtyard cursing at him. Joseph got to picture that. Do we understand what an honor that is? To be able to be a picture of the suffering of Jesus Christ, though in small part... Joseph had an incredible privilege in his life as this happened to him. Continuing on, Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him. He made him overseer of his house and all that he had he put into his hand. Despite the raw deal that Joseph got, he continued to serve and he can serve to the best of his ability. And we see Jesus Christ, even as a son of man, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Here is the creator, the king of kings, the lord of lords, and when he comes, he comes in the form of a servant ministering to others, even though if anyone deserves any kind of ministry and service, it is Jesus Christ himself. We see Joseph, who was raised up above all of his brethren, and yet he resists the temptation. We see that Jesus Christ, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Jesus Christ was completely perfect. There was not even a touch of sin in his life. The spotless Lamb of God resisting all the temptation, though the opportunity was there, the Bible says there's not even a shadow of turning in him. 
him, which means that, you know, let's just say that uh, we go for a walk and there's somebody and they're committing some kind of sin and as we walk by, you say, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, the temptation is there, but you have denied it. There's not even a chance of you going and chasing after that sin. And Jesus Christ, every opportunity to sin was presented there before him as it is for any every other man, but he was never even close to sinning. The answer was always no with Jesus Christ. And yet, despite his perfection, he was still a servant. Yet despite his performance and all the good works that he did, all the miracles that he did, he was still treated as a scoundrel to be chased out of the temple, to be hunted down. Genesis 39, 20 says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Joseph here was suffering for the sins of someone else. It was the sins of Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife was the one who had committed the iniquity. Potiphar's wife was the one who was deserving of prison, who was deserving of death for what she had done, and yet it was Joseph that submitted and went into prison. Though she was guilty, he took her place. We see Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, 4-5. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now I want to go through quickly because I want to cover a couple different little things. But we can see in Genesis chapter 41, we see that Joseph was made the head that every knee would bow to. We see one day Jesus Christ is going to be that head that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We see that Joseph became this point of contact where if you wanted to live, you went to Joseph. If you wanted the bread, you went to Joseph. If you were going to survive, you go to Joseph. You see, Jesus Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the bread that comes down from heaven. He is the door. You go through Jesus Christ. He is the mediator. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And just like you went through Joseph, you only go through Jesus Christ. There is no other name. There is no other way. He is the life. We continue on. We see with Joseph that there's restoration between him and his brethren when repentance is found. And we find the same thing with Jesus Christ. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. We see Joseph weeping when his brethren, even though they have offended him, are restored to him. Again, I talked about how he is crying out. He is wailing in this place. Look at the tender pity and loving care of our great Savior in Luke 19, 41 through 42, which says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. What an incredible testimony of Jesus Christ, our Savior, looking at the city where he knew they were going to crucify him. He wept, not for his sake, but for theirs. God, the creator of the universe, looked at people that were not claiming him as their savior, that never received that peace, that never got that hope of eternal life, and our loving savior wept over them because they'd never know him. What a savior, what a God we serve. Genesis 45, 5, we see Joseph immediately going about to comfort his brethren, letting them know that he is going to take care of them. And we see Jesus Christ do the exact same thing, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. God saying, hey, all of it's for you, so that I can have you. It doesn't matter anymore. Those things, they're as far away as the east is from the west. You can receive this forgiveness. You can have this restoration. We see in Genesis chapter 45 that afterwards that Joseph, he gives assurance to his brother. I'm going to leave you a posterity. I'm going to take care of your kids. I'm going to take care of your family. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. You're going to be okay. And we see Jesus Christ doing the same thing in John 10, 28 through 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand and we see the goodness and the graciousness of Jesus Christ even after all that we have done all the ways we have failed all the ways that we have sinned even though he paid so dearly on that cross for our sins and we have done nothing to deserve it he turns around he saves us at repentance and faith in him and he promises us everlasting life that he'll never leave us or forsake us he's going to take care of us and we see in Joseph a picture of Jesus Christ an incredible picture. Now, I went through that fast, but I wanted to show you what greater work could ever be done 
than to be a reflection of Jesus Christ and his goodness. What greater glory is there than to have the glory of the only begotten Son of God lived out in a person? And so that's why I truly believe the greatest thing that Joseph ever did was not in any individual single task, but it was in a lifetime emulating Jesus Christ, emulating the Savior, picturing him. Remember that verse, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 29? I said I was going to talk about it later. We're here. Romans chapter 8, 28 says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So we know no matter what happens in life, God is going to use it for good. But then people have the question. So here is, you know, the million-dollar question. Well, what is the purpose? We know that the purpose works for good, but what is the purpose so that we can be successful, so that we can accomplish some great thing, so that we can have peace and joy and whatever it may be? No. The answer is found in the next verse. Context is wonderful. Verse number 29 tells us what is that glorious purpose for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he may be the first, might be the firstborn among many brethren. We know all things work together for good, and we also know him who foreknows how they're going to work together for good. And how do they work together for good? To be conformed to the image of his son. The plan of God in your life is that you might reflect his son. That's the end goal. That's what God is trying to accomplish in your life and in my life not some individual task, it's that we might be conformed to the image of his son. And each of us are given different opportunities to do exactly that, but we each have an equal opportunity. It's not found, you know, the, the, the glory of God and the work of God is not found in some kind of title or in some kind of task or in some kind of job that must be done. It is found in bearing the image of his son. The greatest work that could ever be done, we all have a part of if we are saved today being the firstborn of many brethren, so that no matter what happens in our life, we are giving an opportunity to do the greatest work that could ever be accomplished, and that is in emulating Jesus Christ, being a picture of him. You know, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice something. The Bible says that we are changing into the same image. Okay, that's what we're doing. We're changing into the same image. What same image? Well, we're in a glass, we're looking through, and we see the glory of the Lord. And we are changed into that image so that we pass from glory to glory. You know, one day we're going to cross over that glass and we're going to enter into glory and what a day that's going to be. But did you know that we have an opportunity to have that glory, that reflection of Jesus Christ even today? That's the purpose of God in our lives today, that in some small way we'd reflect him. Now we'll never be him, we'll never achieve what he is, but he is working in us so that in some small sliver, in some points in our life, in some day to day as we go about, we can show Jesus Christ and we can share in that glory today. Today we have an opportunity to share in the very glory of God. What greater privilege is there? What greater honor could we ever have than to share with the very glory of God? Not because that glory comes from us, but because beholding him, we are like him. We are reflecting his glory. You know, here's that glass and there's the glory and the brilliance and the beauty of God. And I imagine it as this light that is just bursting off of our Savior. And as we look towards him and we see him, we keep our eyes on him, that light reflects off of us. You know, I can see you right now, why? Because, you know, the lights in here are bouncing off of you and going into my eyes. And I think what God is trying to explain to us here is we have the very glory of God, and as he shines down upon us with his goodness, with his grace, with his love, with his mercy, it reflects off of us. And so we get to share in that glory. We get to pass from glory to glory by being like his son. Colossians chapter 127 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, people want to accomplish something with their lives. They want to do something that matters. They want to have a legacy that lasts. And what greater legacy could there possibly be than I saw Jesus in you? 
That's a legacy that's worth living for. Everything else, what does it matter if it's outside of Christ? No matter what the job is, no matter what the task is, no matter what the title is, what does it matter if it's not a reflection of Jesus Christ? If it doesn't bear that eternal weight of glory, can there be higher praise than someone saying, I saw Jesus Christ in you? I know that that's my hope as a husband, is that in some small way, in, as I will live with my wife on a day-to-day basis that my behavior, my actions, my love, my grace, my mercy would not be from me but from Jesus Christ and she would see Jesus Christ working in me. My hope for my children as they grow up in my home when they see their father that I'm a reflection of a heavenly father who loves them far more than I ever will. It is an awesome responsibility to be able to bear the image of the only begotten son of God where someone could see him in me. I am not deserving of that whatsoever. None of us are, but there is no greater calling. There is no greater job. There is nothing that is more worthwhile in this life than to bear the reflection of the precious Son of God, and he has given us, it is a gift, the ability to serve him in that way. And so while you may be going through life wondering, well, what's the point? What does it matter? Why is it so hard? Maybe, maybe it's in those things that God is working in you in such a great way to reveal his son in you to a lost and dying world that so desperately needs to see him the bible says this in galatians 1 16, to reveal his son in me that i might preach him among the heathen immediately i conferred not with flesh and blood what does flesh and blood matter if jesus christ if god wants to reveal his son in me i think that's our great work That's what we're trying to accomplish, and it can be accomplished in a myriad of different ways. But we all have the same task. Every man, woman, child has an opportunity to reveal his son in me. What if that's how we lived on a day-to-day basis? Looking for every opportunity to reveal his son in me. What a glory that would be. Not for ourselves, but for God. Acts chapter 4, verse number 13, and we'll close with this. The Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they had took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That's a testimony worth living for. I think that's a testimony worth dying for as well. They marked that they had been with Jesus Christ. He saw that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They also had their flaws. They had their foibles. And those things were there But there was something of note. They had been with Jesus Christ, and that testimony was visible through their life, through their actions, through their words. And that's what caused them to marvel. I think the the greatest thing we can do for this world to bring people to a place of marveling and worshiping after God is to reveal His Son in us. I think it is the greatest work that anyone could ever hope to accomplish is to be like Christ. You know, it was in Antioch that people were first called Christians. Why? because it was marked that they were followers of Christ. They could tell that they had been with them. And it ought to be said of everyone who claims the name of Jesus Christ that in some small way, we picture him. We see Joseph, he was a type, uh, a picture of Christ. And God wants to use you in the exact same way today. 